Here we're going to take a look at how the stiffness matrix looks for a beam element that only has transverse and rotational stiffness. All right, let's go ahead and take a look. What do we know so far about a beam element? Well, we can go ahead and draw the beam element. There's what our displacement function looks like as we move from node 1 to node 2, showing our nodal displacements at either end and, of course, the slopes as well. And we can write our displacement function, v of x, in terms of each of the shape functions and their corresponding displacements. There we go, there's our shape functions. So that's what we know so far from a previous presentation. And we can go ahead and continue this, this question of what we know so far, as we know that the shape functions are cubic functions. That equals 1.0 with their respective degree of pardon me, the respective degree of freedom adds zero at all the others. Let me go ahead and write this out again. And we can write out each of the individual shape functions. So there's our first shape function. Here is our second shape function. And if you don't mind the fact that they actually have quite different units between the first and second shape functions, we're just going to draw them on the same plot just so that we can kind of have an idea of how these different shapes look. Finally, here's our last shape function. There we go. So that's what all these different shape functions look like. And we use this form here for our displacement function because it's, it's a way to uh, use superposition, essentially, to describe the influence that each of the nodal displacements, v1 and v2, and nodal rotations, theta1 and theta2, have on the overall displacement throughout that element. So now we're going to go ahead and use our friend the equation of the elastic curve that relates our nodal forces and moments to the nodal displacements and rotations. We can put that in there too. Okay, drawing out our element again, here is each of the nodal displacements and rotations as well as the nodal transverse forces, y1 and y2, and moments m1 and m2. So the equation of the elastic curve is as follows. The moment is equal to elastic modulus times area moment of inertia times the curvature. Our shear is equal to EI multiplied by the derivative of the curvature. In other words, the third derivative of V with respect to X. And we simply take those and apply it to our nodal forces, Y1 and Y2, and moments M1 and M2. And these are really derivatives of the shape functions. Remember what our displacement function looks like. It's in terms of shape functions and their corresponding displacements. And, this, and pardon me, displacements and rotations. And those are just what they are. The displacements and rotations, those are just like coefficients. It's n1, n2, n3, n4. Those are the, those are the, the functions, the cubic functions, that get the, the derivative taken of them when we start applying this equation of the elastic curve. All right, let's go ahead and draw this one more time there. There we go. That's our beam element showing the default positive nodal directions. But when we look at positive shear for an element, it looks like this. When we look at positive bending for an element, it looks like this. And the equation of the elastic curve applied to each of the nodal loads depends on whether these nodal loads are in the same direction or in the opposite direction. I apologize that my pointer does not appear to be working. And so we can see that the moment at node 1 for the node is in the opposite direction as what was considered positive bending. And so we have a negative sign in front. Similarly, when we look at y2 for the node, it goes up. But when we look at positive shear on the right-hand side, What's considered positive shear is going down, so we have a negative sign in front of that equation. Finally, we look at the moment at node 2. We see that it is in the same direction as what is on the right side of the, what's considered positive bending, and so we do not have a sign change there. And so these become the four equations that make up the stiffness matrix. So. There's our first equation, second equation, third equation, and 
the fourth equation. And we're just going to go ahead and write out what these terms look like. So first we take the derivative of the first shape function. We take the derivative of the second shape function. We take the derivative of the third and the fourth. There we go. Apparently I just need to use my finger in order to use that pointer. So there's our first one, second one, third one, and the fourth one. And kind of getting the picture here. Just really the whole purpose of this is showing how we need to take the derivatives of the shape functions when we go ahead and apply each of these equations. There we go. And so each of these terms that we see here, for example, this one, this one, this one, and this one, they end up becoming coefficients in our stiffness matrix equation. Okay, so this one, this one, this one, and this one, just taking a look at those, those end up becoming the first row, the coefficients in the first row of our stiffness matrix equation. Okay, so we're getting, writing these out in more detail. All right, here we have those four terms. Here we have the next four terms. And you'll find when you end up looking at each of these terms, we can almost draw our stiffness matrix right here. We could have like EI out in front. And we could have like this is the first term, second term. Like this, is, this would be like the whole first row. Right, we just put like V1 over here, you know, theta1, V2, theta2, right? This, this whole portion ends up becoming our, our, our uh, stiffness matrix. Let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like. Here's our stiffness matrix for a beam element, only including the transverse and rotation. We're not worrying about the axial stuff. That's the same as, as the truss element. Drawing out our element. There we go. And then we'll go ahead and write our force vector for the element. The here is our stiffness matrix. You can see that these are all the same terms that we had from the previous slide, just put in a matrix form. And there's our displacement vector for the beam element. And that's it. Brings us to our reflective questions. The first reflective question we have is, when does the lateral stiffness of a line element matter? And you can compare this with a truss element. Think about how a truss element really represents a two-force element, or pardon me, two-force member. So when does lateral stiffness matter? Next question is, is what governing equation is used to derive the stiffness matrix for a beam element? And our final question is, what accounts for the sign difference between what we have, one, one version of this governing equation being applied here for our shear load at node one, and then here we have it applied again for node two uh, for the shear loads. Why is there a sign difference? And that concludes this presentation on the stiffness matrix for a beam element.